So how do you undertake a project like this? A man so uh, statue-like in his greatness. How do you do what has not been said about him before? And, and uh, how do you tackle a project like that? Well, with a degree of fear and humility, for sure. Um, you know, I began with the understanding that there's a problem to be solved here, that we had turned him into a monument and a national holiday and lost sight of his humanity and lost sight of his uh, controversial side, that we've, we've, we've made him a safe figure in many ways. So I really um, set out to try to see if I could make him real again. And I began by interviewing people who knew him because there were still scores of people alive who knew King and knew him well, uh, but they were getting up there in years. So I had to hurry and make that my first uh, item on the agenda, even before I was really feeling like I was an expert and I wasn't sure I had enough good questions, but I had to hurry. So I began doing those interviews as fast as I could and, and looking for new archival material, reading everything I could and knowing that this was uh, an audacious project that was going to take me, you know, at least five or six years, uh, which is what happened. It took me six years. Wow. So what new materials did you uncover uh, that hadn't been seen before? And then what's still out there? Well, we know uh, many people were aware that the FBI had released a lot of new uh, transcripts of King's phone calls, uh, as well as phone calls with his, of his advisors, because they were wiretapping not just King's home and office phones, but also the homes of some of his closest uh, friends and associates. Uh, but in addition to that, I was really fortunate and surprised to find how much archival material was out there in private collections. You know, King had a, a basically an official archivist uh, for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, a man named Lawrence Reddick. And his papers, thousands and thousands of pages, were at the Schomburg Library in boxes that hadn't been opened yet. Um, I found Hosea Williams' um, um, archives that had not been published or um, seen by too many people outside his family yet. I found an unpublished autobiography that Daddy King, Martin Luther King Sr., had work, worked on but never, but never got around to seeing in print. So lots of stuff like that. And also um, audio tapes that Coretta made when she was working on her memoir back in 1968. So um, really surprised at how much new material there was. Yeah, I had no idea Coretta Scott was her own, uh, in her own right, an activist, and really probably ahead of Martin when they met. Yeah, I think that's what really attracted him to her, because he dated a lot of women, a lot of really intelligent, beautiful women um, with great, you know, um, educations and careers in the, in, the, in the coming days ahead. But um, what I think really drew him to Coretta was the fact that she'd been to Antioch College, an integrated school. She'd been involved in protest movements there. She'd attended the Progressive Party's National Convention. She really had um, far more experience than he did as an activist when they met in Boston. Yeah. Yeah, you said something there. Let's just repeat that to let it sink in because the, I think current generation doesn't under, quite understand how bad things were back uh, when King was c c coming of age. United States government tapped his phones and recorded his sex and threatened to use, this is revenge porn. This is illegal. This is against the law. How is this possible? Well, we could talk about that for an hour. And <laughs> I should say that um, the president of the United States knew what was going on. The media knew what was going on. Members of Congress knew what was going on. They knew it was illegal. They knew it was morally wrong. And they all turned the other way. Not a single newspaper reporter who was fed these files ever thought, maybe I should write about this. They, they patted themselves on the back for not reporting on King's sex life, but they failed to report on the much bigger story, which was that our government was spying on a private citizen. And to answer your question, how did it happen? Some of it comes out of the fear of communism, the, the worry that King was being influenced by members of the Communist Party of the U.S., but... That's not enough to explain it, because racism is really at the core of it. This fear that black people, if they actually unite, and if they actually come together in enough of a way to force change, will upset the, the balance of power, will put an end to white nationalist, white Christian nationalism. Um, and Herbert Hoover, I mean, I'm sorry, J. Edgar Hoover, the uh, director of the FBI, um, is clearly, you know... A obsessed with maintaining the white Christian status quo and who is in charge in this country. And, and he's, he's offended by the idea that King might, um, uh, might challenge that. Yeah. And did, did a judge need to sign off on the wiretapping or just, just J Edgar Hoover? Oh, no, J Edgar Hoover needed uh, permission, but he got it from uh, Robert F. Kennedy. So the attorney general uh, is, uh, uh, signed off on it. And, later said, um, you know, I want to check on this. I want to, you know, a, um, an expiration date. Let's review this in, I can't remember, six months. 
and and if we're not seeing any signs of communist activity, let's let's pull the plug. But we never did pull the plug. The uh, mm-hmm. the surveillance continued. Robert F. Kennedy signed off on it. Amazing. Yeah, and JFK knew about it too, and uh, LBJ not only knew about it but encouraged it, and sort of seemed to wallow in uh, the gossip around King's sex life. Right. Yeah, it's just, again, uh, today, as, as I like to say, conservatives today are more socially liberal than liberals were in the 1950s and 60s. We've all come so far. It's just hard to kind of fathom that, you know, and now RFK Jr. is running for president. You think of the Kennedy family, King, they're all on the same team, same page. Well, not not exactly. No, not exactly at all. And And we should remember that King was very skeptical of the Kennedys. He thought that they were dragging their feet on civil rights. They owed... Uh, a commitment they owed uh, black Americans for getting them into office and that they were afraid to do what they knew was right, that they were afraid to do the moral thing because they were worried about losing some votes in the South. And King had to really, you know, hold their feet to the fire. And he was, um, you know, he was, he was, um, had a hard time understanding the way these political operatives worked. He couldn't understand why they wouldn't think like moral humans, that they, why they wouldn't do what they believed. He knew they believed in the right thing. Why couldn't, why wouldn't they actually act on those beliefs? And, and maybe he was being naive, but um, it was frustrating for him. All right, let's go back in time. Give us a little um, biography of King's parents, grandparents, great grandpa, however, however far back you could go. And along the way, kind of remind us all of what life was like for uh, the black community in America, say late 19th, early 20th century into the 30s and 40s and 50s. You know, King's grandparents are born into enslavement, and um, his grandfather um, is um, really seeing the worst of what America has to offer for black people. He's he's born a slave. He's freed soon after, but can't escape sharecropping. You know, um, America uh, refuses to really set uh, black people free. It keeps finding new ways to try to keep them into the second class status. And um, Jim King is as uh, Martin Luther King's father um, was known. Um, Jim King uh, worked as a sharecropper all his life in Stockbridge, Georgia, and never uh, learned to read or write, never got the chance to vote, never could own any property. Uh, he, was, he was working for the white man on land that uh, the white man owned and making just enough to pay his rent. And it was King's father, Martin Luther King Sr., who was actually uh, Mike King um, at the time, who decided that he, he couldn't take it anymore. He saw his father turning to, you know, an alcoholic, uh, an abusive, angry man, and Michael King uh, walked off the farm and made his way to Atlanta and learned to read and write, became a preacher, and really paved the way for uh, Martin Luther King Jr. to be the man he became. And, and that's a, an enormously heroic act for, for Michael King to, to leave that farm and to just find that, like, he's going to make his own way. And, and some of that means helping improve yourself, but he also understands that with that comes the responsibility to try to fight for the rights of black people, to try to um, get this nation to live up to the promises that it, that the empty promises that it made in its founding documents. Can you remind us what sharecropping is? Yeah, sharecropping is this system of, of indentured servitude where you, um, you for the right to, to live on this land, you farm and pay your rent. And when you finish harvesting your crops and you take them into market, you find that you've, you've, you've no matter how much you raise, no matter how many crops you bring to the market, you manage to raise just enough to pay your rent and your supplies. And the landlord owns all your tools, owns, owns your farm animal, owns your farm, farm anim, animals, and you are forever in this cycle of servitude with no chance to escape. And um, the King family farm, um, which they, they couldn't own, is, is a Walmart today. And um, the King uh, family might have owned that land if they'd been given a chance to, to earn real money for their crops. Yeah, and that goes on into the 20th century. Without a doubt. Uh, we still see, uh, in particular, poor black families uh, struggling to own land, having that land taken away from them uh, many different ways, and um, that system of uh, you know, privilege continues today. Yeah. Yeah, these are all arguments that the reparations activists today make, and they're not completely unreasonable. I understand that. <laughs> Uh, you know, when you really dig into that history, it's pretty dark. It's pretty grim and probably still accounts to a certain extent for the wealth disparity and income inequality between blacks and whites. Yeah. And King talked about that all the time. He said, um, you know, don't say to us to pull ourselves up from our bootstraps when 
never had the chance even to, to buy boots. Um, so <laughs> right. the, um, and that's, and we forget too, that that's what he talked about in the, I have a dream speech. We only remember the part about, I have a dream and content of our character. But in the first half of that speech, uh, the part that he had actually written out, he talked about the fact that government owed black people something for its, you know, years of service uh, for which it had not been compensated. And that was a debt that had never been paid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So he's born in, when was it? 39 or 1929, 29. Yeah. Sorry. And uh, so he's coming of age in the depression. And so they're already living in poverty anyway. And then the depression must make it much worse. His father. So he's he's called daddy King, I guess. (laughs) Uh, was the minister at the Ebenezer Baptist Church, which is what King made famous. That church is still there. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'll tell you a funny story. In 1996, I think it was, my best friend, Michael Coles, living in um, in, um, in Georgia, it's, it ran against Newt Gingrich uh, for the congressional seat, right? And M- Michael is a fairly rich guy, made his money uh, in the chocolate chip, Amer- Great American Chocolate Chip Cookie Company. So I'm going to be get into politics. So he runs against Newt. And on the Sunday before the Tuesday vote, I flew back there to be with him. This is in Kennesaw. And so we drove into the Ebenezer Baptist Church where I said, what are we, what are we doing here? He goes, oh, you'll see. <laughs> so I'd never been at a black church. And this was an eye opener for me because I, you know, when I was religious, I just went to this, these boring Presbyterian sermons that were more like lectures. And I had no idea what this was like. I mean, people are standing up and sitting down and singing and holding hands and, you know, amen, brother. And, you know, it's sort of this interactive process with the minister. And it's like, Wow. <laughs> and then at the moment, and then um, the preacher says, uh, hey, by the way, guess who's here today? Our, it's our friend Michael Coles. And, uh, you know, Tuesday's an important day <laughs> and you know what to do. And I went, oh, I see what we're doing here. And I see how this works. You know, they can't officially endorse a candidate, right? Because the uh, religious nonprofit. But but this is, you know, you know what to do. <laughs> Tuesday's an important day. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's not just the right that does this. Everybody does this to a certain extent. Anyway, but I just thought that was a very moving experience. So, and, and also kind of colors in why he was so effective as a, as a preacher. It's not a lecture. You make, you make a point in one, in one of your chapters that, you know, he would switch between lecturing and preaching, and it was a different process. Yeah, King uh, loved to preach, and he grew up hearing, you know, sermons all his life. He learned to quote from the Bible before he could read. And his father, his grandfather, uh, were both preachers. Uh, he, he, he lived in this neighborhood where he could walk to, you know, half a dozen churches, and he sampled the different varieties of preaching to see which suited him best. And he didn't like the way his father preached. A big part of what drives Martin Luther King to become Martin Luther King is this feeling that, like, he wants to do better than his father. His father's this country preacher, very emotional, whooping and hollering and walking through the aisles and stomping the podium, and, and King wants to be more of an intellectual preacher. But they share this desire, this understanding that you know, the black social gospel is about more than just saving your soul. It's about saving the country. It's about redeeming the nation's soul. And, and that comes directly from his father. So he's just finding a different voice, a different way of expressing that. But um, King would say all his life that fundamentally he's a, he's, he sees himself as a Baptist preacher. He doesn't see himself as a political leader. He doesn't see himself as a, a community organizer or a, a, an activist by nature. He's a he's a preacher, and that's why I think when you see him, uh, when you watch videos of him today, he seems most comfortable, most happy uh, when he's in that pulpit. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think that also touches on a, a, a modern cut in Christianity between the social gospel that the job of Christians are to help poor people, man, the soup kitchens, you know, correct injustices. So on. And the other prosperity gospel that, you know, our job is to get rich because that's what God wants us to do. That's more, more, I guess, conservative Christianity, something like that. It's an interesting division. I think that's probably been there a long time. Yeah, it probably has. And, and King um, was, 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 you know, not a materialist. In fact, spoke out against materialism and militarism and really um, wanted people to, uh, he lived in his, in his own way in a very modest life, much to the frustration of his wife. He wouldn't even put carpet down in the in the rooms in the house where where guests would see it because he thought it, it reeked of opulence. So he he Coretta begged him for some carpeting in the bedrooms at least, and he went along with that. Uh, but he he was a very modest and humble man in a in a way. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because he always looks so sharp. He always has these great suits on. 
And I always wonder, what's it like to be in the South in the summer? I've been there. It's miserably <laughs> hot and humid. And he's got a suit on. <laughs> yeah, only uh, on a couple of occasions will you see him you know, take off that jacket. Like when he's marching through Mississippi with Stokely Carmichael in 66, he's in shirt sleeves. He's wearing straw hat and sunglasses. And you're like, whoa, who is that? Uh, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, he, he knew the image that, that he was trying to convey. And that was very important, I should say, to convey that image because he was trying to, you know, it was, it was a, an issue of respectability. And he knew that for a lot of white people, this was the first time that they were being forced to confront a man who was named Dr. King. And they couldn't mm. call him Michael or Martin. You know, uh, this is um, about respect. So conveying that image was really important to him. So religion was an important early influence on him. I think you, more than anybody I've read about King, uh, points out that he was really religious. This was not a just a strategic uh, institution to use for driving civil rights, but because I've often thought of his influences, influencers as like Gandhi, who's definitely not a, a religious in any Western sense, or, or uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, or some of the more secular liberal theologians that have influenced him. Maybe I've overplayed that. Maybe he, uh, I get the impression from your book, he really believed the gospel message. It was yeah, not I think strategic. I think there's no question about that. And if you look at the influences of Gandhi and Niebuhr, Absolutely. He's an intellectual and he's learning from them. But you also have to look at someone like William Thurman, who coalesces uh, the, the influences of Gandhi, Niebuhr, and Christ, of course, you know, and, and who comes from a preaching background. And, and King is always rooted in the Bible. So he learns about Gandhi. He learns how to make use of Gandhi. But that's in addition to the foundation that he's already got, which is, you know, the teachings of Jesus. And I think that um, every time he's challenged, every time People say to him, just stick to Gandhi, just stick to, stick to using nonviolence in the South. He says, no, I can't do that because the Bible doesn't say, you know, you pick your battles. The Bible says we have to oppose injustice everywhere. We have to impose, you know, war everywhere. I can't, I can't focus on, on the convenient parts. You know, he, he's not a political strategist. He's a moral leader. Hmm. All right, talk about his education a little bit, where he went to a school, college, and, and theological school and all that, and how that uh, influenced. Yeah, he starts at Morehouse when he's only at Morehouse College when he's only 16 years old. He skips a couple of grades, and he's small. He's always small, but he's especially small for his age, which is why he likes to dress nicely to try to compensate for the fact that you know his nickname on at Morehouse is Runt, you know, because he's, <laughs> and then he then he some people start calling him Tweed because he has this Tweed jacket that he wears all the time, very professorial, um, and he's not a great student. Um, you know, he he got you know B's and C's at, usually at best. I think he got one A in all of his years at Morehouse. And, um, and that's because he skipped a couple of grades and the you know, Atlanta public schools weren't very good when it came to educating black kids. So he suffered for that all his life and um, really had to compensate with his charm and with his, you know, his oratorical skills and his great gift for memorization. And, and um, you know, he's, a, he's an amazing communicator, but he has difficulty writing and, and difficulty with math. His sister had to sort of uh, tutor him through the math classes. Uh, so he goes from Morehouse to um, seminary at Crozer in Pennsylvania, first time really leaving the, the South for a, a long stretch of time, and dates a white girl at Crozer, by the way, which is uh, interesting, and falls in love with her, really wants to marry her, but is discouraged from doing so because of the effects it'll have on his career, his ability to, to work as a pastor in the South. Um, you, you mean discouraged by his family? Yeah, his family and his advisors, his, his mentors, um, a lot of his black friends said, you know, just don't do it. And it tore him up. You know, he, Harry Belafonte told me that, you know, King talked about it all his life. Like, what would have happened if I had married Betsy, Betty? Um, he really loved her. And um, he just felt like it was too big of a burden. He, you know, it's one of the rare instances where he, he didn't follow his, 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 his gut. And, um, you know, uh, he asked. Would, would that, just excuse me, would that have yeah, even been legal? Because I'm just thinking of the Supreme Court case, Loving case, 1967. It was legalized inter interracial marriage. So could have he, he even done that? Yeah, uh, some states. Um, some states they, allowed it. Yeah, he couldn't. Right. Some couldn't. Um, so I think uh, you know he 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 spoke to one of his his mentors and said maybe love is more important than my career, um, but ultimately he he compromised and um, and told her he couldn't marry her. And uh, I should point out that you know his father was a, was opposed to him going to seminary. 
and opposed to him seeking a doctorate, thought he didn't need it. You know, you're just going to be a, you know, a, you're going to come back to Atlanta, you're going to preach at Ebenezer, you don't need those fancy degrees. But King was was really interested in the intellectual material. He was really interested in understanding um, spirituality and the intellectual, you know, um, prop behind it. And and I think he had an idea that he one day would become a college professor or a college president. That was really his vision. He He was certainly not... He wanted to go back down south and help fight Jim Crow, but he wanted to do it from the pulpit for a little while and then think about how he could be an educator. Yeah. Well, you do kind of have to have that the, the degree, the, the union card, as we call it in academia. You can only go so far with, with a bachelor's or a master's. I remember I had a master's degree, and I was trying to decide if I should get a PhD or not, and I saw Carl Sagan give a talk. It was like, Dr. Sagan. I went, Dr. Sagan, yeah. Yeah, you got to have that. I mean, that just adds you know, some credibility. Sounds and, good. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So who were some of his uh, like professorial mentors that kind of nudged him in one direction versus another? Well, I mentioned William Thurman, who um, yeah. had also been at, at uh, Howard University and had attended Morehouse, actually attended about the same time that Daddy King was at Morehouse. And then he, he ended up at Boston at the, as the dean of chapel, when King was at uh, more, was at Boston University getting his doctorate, so William Thurman was an important influence. Benjamin Mays, the president of Morehouse, was a huge influence. You know, the interesting thing about Thurman is that he not only comes from the same background as a Southern Baptist preacher, but he's been to India and he studied with Gandhi. And it's Thurman who says that that Gandhi told him that the um, the true um, the true path to explaining nonviolence, the, the, the realization of nonviolent tactics may make itself known in the, in the experience of, of the Negro and the black American, that this may be, it may be the, the, the black Americans who really teach us the power of nonviolence. And um, William Thurman uh, certainly had MLK's ear um, explaining that. In fact, they watched the uh, World Series together one year, uh, Thurman and, and King, when Jackie Robinson was playing. And I wonder sometimes if they considered the way in which Jackie Robinson exemplified some of the teachings of, of Gandhi. Oh, right. Yes, because Branch Rickey said, you cannot fight back. That's right. You must turn the other cheek. But, but um, as, as King did, uh, Robinson understood that there was a great power in nonviolence and that it would give you a moral upper hand. And then you could find ways to fight back once you proved that you were dedicated to nonviolence. Right. But it must have been really hard. I mean, the temperament you'd have to have, not everybody could do that, you know, to be able to kind of swallow your pride and ego and, and take it just strategically as a strategy to get social change. No, it's remarkable. And, you know, there's, I always think about this one occasion when King was giving a speech in Birmingham at a, at a church and a white man, a not member of the, of the Nazi party of America, stood up from the crowd, walked up on stage and just slugged King in the face, just punched him, knocked King down. And um, King got up. He was examined by a doctor, and he, he never put his hands up even. He uh, was examined by a doctor, and then King insisted on meeting with the man, uh, didn't want to press charges, and invited him to come back and listen to the rest of his speech. Mm. And Coretta was furious with him. Coretta said, uh, you know, what, what if he had a gun? You know, you invited him back to come listen to the rest of your speech. What if he <laughs> yeah. had a gun? And King said, well, I think if he had a gun, he would have used it the first time. <laughs> yeah, you have a nice picture of that meeting. Yeah, that's Just the meeting, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I also like this other picture here. It reminds us of how young he was. Graduating from college at age 19. I mean, yeah. he's just a kid. Yeah, you can see he's <laughs> trying on that mustache. He's trying to get that mustache going. <laughs> he must have been pretty smart, though, to skip grades and all that. Maybe he didn't do well in math or whatever. Maybe he was distracted in some of his classes by other things. But obviously, he had to be super bright. No question. I mean, a, a brilliant mind. And his, his part of his brilliance is his ability to synthesize you know, which gets him in trouble when it comes to plagiarizing, but it's it's also part of his great gift because he can take the Bible verses and he can take Langston Hughes and he can take sermons he's heard on the radio by white ministers in the North and he can bring it all together in a way that becomes his own, kind of like the, you know, the great jazz musicians, the way, you know, Louis Armstrong brought together opera and Dixieland and all these other influences and pop tunes, you know, from Broadway shows to make it his own and to make it distinctly black American. And, and King had that great gift too. Yeah. Parenthetically, you know, there's research in uh, psychology on the effects of hype 
that, you know, taller men are more likely to win elections. Women like taller men. They get more dates, on and on and on, all the influences that height has. But if you have, for each degree you have, I think it's the equivalent of like two more inches. <laughs> so I'm interested in this because at 5'8", okay, 5'7", uh, you know, I realized, okay, if I have multiple degrees and I'm more like I'm 5'10", 5'11", something like that. So maybe King had some of that because he also had oh, a lot of charisma. Great. So intelligence and and a, a dynamic personality can, can make up for Yeah, and King was only 5'7". And, <laughs> and um, the, one of the first things women said when they met him is, oh, he was much shorter than I expected. And he got that all his <laughs> life because you expect this towering figure. Um, but he was only five seven. He had he had three degrees though, so that hits him up to what five yeah, eleven right. or five, six degree. one That's by right. your standard. Yeah. And yeah, he had, yeah. had, and in college he was the only guy who had a car. And I think that was good for a couple <laughs> of inches too. <laughs> That's really funny. All right, so the uh, you know the non statue version that let's address the plagiarism issues. I guess you know when that came out, it was like oh okay, what does this mean? It wasn't clear to me whether it was just sloppiness, just forgot to write down the sources and, and then forgot to transcribe it into his own words, or if it was more than that. What is your sense? Well, it was definitely some sloppiness, and it was definitely some, you know, um, not thinking of himself in the, uh, in the academic terms that the academic standards applied to him. He thought of himself maybe as a preacher who uh, was accustomed to borrowing, and it was an oral tradition, and I don't think he ever adapted or his advisors didn't really force him to adapt to the, the stricter rules regarding a dissertation. But, it, you know, even in high school, I found an example of where he plagiarized a, a speech for, a, for a, a statewide high school speaking contest. And he plagiarized it from the most obvious source. He, he, there was a book in the, uh, that was common in high school libraries called, um, you know, 50 award-winning student speeches. So he, he just, he cribbed it from the most obvious place. And even when he was cribbing his um, college, um, his dissertation for Boston University, he took it from a dissertation that had been written just a few years earlier and had been submitted to his same advisor. So it seems like he wasn't trying very hard to hide it. And, and, and when he, you know, plagiarized later, you know, I have a dream that comes from Langston Hughes, the most famous black poet in America. So I think King was not really feeling much, um, much, you know, uh, he wasn't feeling secretive about this. He was, this is how he worked. In, in the sense, more of a preacher or like a comedian or an actor or whatever, just kind of cribbing together different phrases or turns of phrases into your own particular way of doing it. Yeah, he felt his job was to move audiences. His job was not to impress um, academic advisors. And mm -hmm. even when he was writing his dissertation, when perhaps he should have been a little bit more, he certainly should have been a little bit more cautious and aware of his audience. Um, it just wasn't the way he was wired. I always liked this, um, you know, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I named, titled my book above me there, The Moral Arc, after that. But he got this from Theodore Parker, an abolitionist preacher who wrote in 1853, before the Civil War, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I'm sure it bends towards justice. So him, you know, just nabbing that piece and throwing it into a, his how long, not long speech, that's kind of what preachers do. So that's not really plagiarism. No, I agree. And he's using it really effectively to move an audience, uh, literally, you know, thousands of people in front of him on the street. And also, you know, important people watching on television, uh, presidents, um, congressmen. And, and he understands that that's much more important than citing his sources. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, because I'm just trying to square that circle in my mind, you know, super uh, ethical man and, and engages in plagiarism, which in academia is, you know, hugely... Bad. <laughs> yeah, but a uh, super ethical man who's also, you know, a profound, um, repeated um, adulterer who's, uh, you know, never faithful to, to his wife, you know, pretty much throughout their marriage. And that's harder for me to square even because that's, mm. um, you know, that's a much more intimate connection that he's violating than, than the plagiarism rules. Okay, since we're on that, uh, as I understand it, he's the first powerful man in the history of the world to ever do this. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> he's the first. And, and no one ever since has done this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But he is perhaps the first you know, powerful man in America who has done this, who has um, had his conduct 
uh, turned into a, a weapon to be used against him by the federal government. You know, that's mm. that's what's extraordinary about it. And to me, that's why it's it's important, why I, I did not shy away from dealing with it in the book, because, yes, it reveals that he was a flawed human being, but what it really reveals is the fact that our government used his flaws to try to not just uh, damage him, but to damage the entire civil rights movement, to divide and conquer black leaders so that they would not be successful in changing the American power structure. Yeah. Certainly, uh, I mean, ethically, he made a contract, marriage contract with his wife. He shouldn't have done that. Okay, yep, for sure. And you just don't do that. But the male psychology is very different than the female psychology. We know this from massive studies in evolutionary psychology, the work of David Buss and others that have just huge data sets now from these dating sites. Like, how many sexual partners would you like in a lifetime? And men, it's like 10 times the number that hmm. women, uh, women. Or like on these dating sites, the, you know, okay, Cupid and those. You know, how many dates would you need to go on before you'd be intimate with this person? And for the women, the average was seven. For men, it was less than one. <laughs> that means for every guy that said two dates, there was some guy that said, why go no, on a no. date? <laughs> right. I mean, it's just, and women are far more risk averse and careful and selective men are just much more promiscuous. That's just kind of across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just primate. You know, this is explained by natural selection. So on. Uh, not that that okay is it. Cause if you agree with your partner, okay, we're going to, you know, have a exclusive relationship here, then you don't do it. But you know, again, it's it's not like he was some freak of nature. Like, oh, this was oh, otherwise he was a great man. Just so unusual, he did this. Not unusual at all. I mean, this you know, it's right. a story after this morning. I read a story about RFK Jr. Uh, you know, he was a he was a heroin addict for a while, and then he cheated on his wife. And they and they treat this like this is so unusual, and he's running mm -hmm. for president. It's like that's not unusual at all for somebody who's famous. Yeah, and when you are famous, and uh, certainly in the world of you know Baptist preachers, there's a there's an additional level of uh, of commonality here. Um, so it's it's something that you know we that we targeted that we chose to single out about King. When I say we, I mean our government, the federal government, and and it was yeah. for obvious purposes. Yeah, yeah, to blackmail him essentially. I mean that letter that uh, find online, essentially they're asking him to kill himself, right? Or, yeah, that seems least, to be the suggestion. Yeah. And, you know, they send a tape of King's recordings from his hotel rooms. Uh, they send that, um, Coretta opens it, listens to it. So they're clearly trying to destroy the marriage at the very least. And the letter says, you know, you know what you have to do. You've got, you know, X number of days to do it or else, you know, you're going to be ruined. And um, the, the clear suggestion is that he needs to kill himself or else this material is going to be leaked to the press and his reputation will be, be done. Yeah not just stop being a civil rights activist and go be a private citizen and, and leave us alone. It was take yourself out completely. Yeah. And the FBI was working on other ways to take him out. You know, they were uh, looking to replace him. They were grooming another, you know, black man to become the leader of the civil rights movement. That, not that that would ever work, but that's the way their minds were working. They were just thinking we've, he's the most dangerous, not because, not because he's the most fiery or because he's uh, threatening violence. He's the most dangerous because he's the most popular. He might mm. actually succeed in uniting the factions and in bringing support from whites. He's dangerous because his vision is acceptable and might actually change American society. And these are these are men who are opposed to change. Yeah, yeah. When I was researching uh, my conspiracy book, I was reading about the FBI's COINTEL Pro program. It wasn't just King. You know, they they were apparently some of these civil rights groups where there were more uh, FBI agents than there were regular members sitting in there, right? right? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, and they they weren't just spying. They were actually, like, doing things to make the group look bad, like committing violent acts or something like that. Yeah, no, it was deep, and it, and it was powerful, and it's a real, you know, scar on, a, on, our, on our history. It's, a, it's something that we don't seem to have learned from uh, because we're still um, viewing protest leaders as, 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 as the enemy, when in fact, more often they are, you know, they are seizing the moral high ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Again, so like current events, uh, you know, this RFK Jr., he's really out there on some of the conspiracy theories, but he's not completely crazy because, you know, when he talks about things like this, things that happen, and, and when he talks, like when he was on Rogan the other day, he's, you know, you know, my uncle did this, and he's like, your mm -hmm. uncle? Oh, wait, that's JFK. <laughs> He's talking about you know, my dad, my uncle, my other uncle. It's like, oh, these are huge names, right? 
but at, at the time there were some pretty there were there are reasons why we shouldn't necessarily just tr- blindly trust government agencies they are not always to be trusted no clearly and they're very often uh, designed to to maintain the status quo which is which is a, a problem when you want to you also want to encourage reform you want to encourage fresh thinking you want to encourage people to challenge authority and to look and embrace new ideas you know king was fairly humble about these things. When when he was challenged by people like Malcolm X or Stokely Carmichael, he would say, listen, I don't believe I have all the answers. I'll listen. I'll, I'll, I, I may not agree with them. I may not get, you know, get on board. I, will, I won't say black power because that sounds like violence, but I do think black people in general need to have more power. Um, so he was open-minded and, and that's the kind of, you know, attitude that's hard for the people in power to embrace. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about Malcolm X because we have this cardboard history of, you know, he was the you know, the violent activist and King was the intellectual, uh, you know, nonviolent activist. And so that's too simple. And maybe while you're at it, since you wrote a biography of Ali, what the relationship was between Ali and Malcolm X. Yeah, Malcolm X is, is one of our great, like, grassroots protest heroes. And, and he has this real appeal because he is from the outside the system. He's, you know, even more so than King, who, who's, you know, somewhat conservative, who's raised in the church, who's, you know, from a middle class background. Malcolm is out of prison was where he's educated and he joins this group the nation of islam that's really seen as as out there and some people describe it as a as a a sect uh as a cult um some people would describe it as a terrorist group so malcolm is is a greater threat and that's really appealing to a lot of people who are losing faith in the in the system losing hope that america will ever voluntarily integrate and that's what appeals to muhammad ali he's really drawn to the nation of islam and to malcolm because they're saying Forget it. We don't need white people. We'll do this on our own. And, and that is really, especially for young folks, that's really appealing. You know, um, let's not wait for, for something to be handed to us. Let's just take what we deserve. Uh, and Malcolm X and, and Martin Luther King become antagonists in that sense that, you know, Martin Luther King is, is working within the system. He's fighting for ch- late changes in the law and, and he achieves, helps achieve you know, two of the greatest um, pieces of legislation ever passed in American history, the Voting Rights Act and the and the um, and the Civil Rights Act, under signed by President Johnson, but Malcolm is out there all the time saying he's an Uncle Tom. He's wasting he's wasting his time. White people are never they may they may commit to some legislative change, but they're never going to submit. They're never going to commit to the kind of you know deep emotional change that, that this country needs. Um, what's interesting about it though is that again you know Malcolm and, and King are changing as they get older, and they seem to be coming together more. Um, James Baldwin wrote that by the end of their lives, they were barely distinguishable in terms of their philosophies. And um, part of the reason we continue to perpetuate this, this sense of them as antagonists is because the media like to play that up. And um, in fact, I discovered that Alex Haley made up one of the most famous quotes. Malcolm X, um, uh, Martin Luther King was asked what he thought about Malcolm X. And um, King said, well, I don't think I have all the answers. I, you know, I think Mal- I don't like it when Malcolm talks about violence, but, but I think you know, we can learn from each other. And, and that's not what Playboy printed. Playboy printed, uh, Alex Haley uh, submitted this article and Playboy printed it saying almost the opposite, that, that I think Malcolm's doing with his demagogic oratory, Malcolm X is, is doing nothing but bringing harm to, to the black people. And so um, even then, you know, even when, when King tried to be open-minded and express you know, uh, a willingness to, to talk to Malcolm X, uh, the media yeah, that was that part inspiring. of your book... That really bugged me. I thought, really, Playboy, somebody edited, uh, or Alex Haley himself edited it that way to make it look what? To more conflicting because that'll sell more magazines? Cause it's yeah. Like something Controversy like that. sells, it, yeah. I think that was it. Yeah. But it's lying. The, no, it's a lie. <laughs> it's a, and, it, and that lie has lived now for 60 years. And if I hadn't gone back to the, the archives and found the transcript of the original interview, that lie would have lived forever. Unbelievable. Kudos to you to find that, as well as the audio tape of the uh, "Tell him about the dream, Martin." Like, like he, you know, he was just up there spontaneously speaking his greatest speech ever, <laughs> and that you found out what that that he was already talking about the "I have a dream." Yeah, so I love that. You know, a lot of uh, other books have said that Mahalia Jackson inspired King. That the speech was falling a little bit flat. He was reading from the text, and Mahalia thought, "Well, this isn't going well. He should talk about the dream because she'd heard him give the dream sermon before." So um, according to that version of events, Mahalia sort of interrupts him and says, 
tell him about the dream, Martin. And, and then he goes into this, you know, great, his most famous speech of all time. But I found that was not true at all, that King uh, had his written speech. And then when he finished it, he immediately pivoted into the dream because he wanted to. He just wanted to keep going. And then Mahalia, a little bit later, after he's already doing the dream, Mahalia echoes him and says, yes, that's right. Tell him about the dream, Martin. And, mm. and the, the media book writers over the years have gotten it wrong. So I'm glad we fixed that one, too. Yeah, King, another King great, deserves the great, credit. Another great find, yeah. Yeah, I think of preachers like that as it's performance. It's performance art, like a comedian. Uh, and they restructure things because it sounds better this way or, or, or this part goes better here rather than there. I remember um, Julia, the Saturday Night Live uh, comedian Julia Sweeney uh, did this um, monologue and God said, ha, huh, about her cancer and her loss of faith from Catholicism and so on. Anyway, then she became an atheist after reading Richard Dawkins and me and Sam Harris and others. And so then she wanted to workshop at Caltech when I had a series there, her um, uh, letting go of God. You know, this is how I lost my religion. So I remember she told the story in a certain way, like she went to the preacher and he said this, and don't you worry your pretty little head about that gospel thing. There's no conflict there. We'll work that out. You know, and she's pointing out stuff in the Bible. It's contradictory. Anyway, then when I finally saw the tape version for HBO that she taped in a Hollywood studio, uh, it's like it was a completely different story. Like it wasn't, it wasn't preacher so-and-so, it was this other guy and it was in a different part of the story. And I said, what, why did you do that? She goes, oh, it worked better in this way rather than that way. I went, oh, <laughs> so this isn't like a perfect scholarly biography, autobiography. This is a show, right? That's right. You got to know. <laughs> you know, what your product is and who your audience is. And there are moments yeah. where, you know, historical accuracy, and I think my book, you know, is, is it's important to maintain historical accuracy. Uh, but when King is given a sermon, um, it's about moving the audience. It's about moving the nation. As he said, you know, he's fundamentally a, a preacher. And, and preaching is about getting people to rethink their lives, to be better people. It's not about, you know, telling the story the most accurate way or having the best citations so that your sources are all... Uh, properly yeah thanked yeah, yeah yeah i was uh when i wrote about um in my prologue to the moral arc i talked about his how long speech at the end of the psalm of the Montgomery march where he uses a lot of these biblical tropes uh let's see here i'll just read this um uh, that he was uh, let's see oh king, and and from the platform oh yeah that he spoke in a platform not on the steps king delivered his stirring anthem to freedom first recalling how they had marched through desolate valleys rested on rocky byways were scorched by the sun, slept in the mud, and were drenched by rain. The crowd, consisting of freedom-loving people who had assembled from around the United States, listened intently as Dr. King implored them to remain committed to the nonviolent philosophy of civil disobedience. Then he goes into his, How long will prejudice blind the visions of men, darken their understanding, and drive bright-eyed wisdom from their sacred throne? How long will justice be crucified and truth bear it? And so on and so on. Lots of biblical uh, tropes here. Uh, Truth crushed to earth will rise again. No lie can live forever. You shall reap what you sow. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Yeah. So he would pull from other preachers and the Bible and so on, just scriptural uh, phrases like that that work so well. Yeah, and he knew that that was a way to really connect with his audience and to call upon you know a higher moral authority. That the governor of Alabama was 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 behind him in the in the in the state house eating his lunch. Um, and not out there listening, but he knew that this gave him a higher moral authority than the governor. Governor may be elected to office, may have a, a seat in that in that you know beautiful building behind them, but he had the Bible, and that was a greater power. Yeah. All right, let's talk about his strategic, um, uh, like a, a bus pro protest. Sorry, uh, you know the sit-ins and and all these things. He purposely went to some of the worst places you could go, right? Uh, I mean, kind of look, like, why would you go to Bull Connor, you know, the biggest racist in the South? Well, because that's where the problem is. And that's where the media is going to cover. Yeah, he saw himself as a lightning rod. He knew that if he could focus the attention, the power would come with that. And that, you know, if, if you if you go into a, an easy city where, you know, they're easy, they're eager to negotiate and, and you work out an agreement, that's fine. It gets you an agreement. For you know that particular town, and he saw that happened in you know in Albany, Georgia. You know the, the the city agreed to make some changes just to keep him quiet to get him out of town. And then once they left town, not much happened. So King discovered that he really needed conflict. Conflict helped focus the nation's attention. 
Conflict helped raise these difficult moral questions. Conflict forced, you know, even some white Southern ministers to think about which they had to, which, which belief was more powerful for them, their, their, their biblical views or their, you know, political and economic views. And it certainly forced people in the North to look down and say, wow, look at what's going on down there. And this, here's Martin Luther King um, and, and, and his followers being hammered by, by water hoses, by um, police batons, by attacked by dogs. So it changed the balance of the of the of the equation for the nation, and it and it put pressure on politicians to do something about it. So King really understood that that part of his job was to be a showman and to put on this great morality play. Right, and it worked. It worked. <laughs> um, yeah, and then talk about his you know the letters from Birmingham jail. I mean that's probably his most famous piece of serious writing. Yeah, and again it's um. It's a collection of all the things he's learned over the years. It's a collection of all the philosophy he's studied and, and the, and the um, Bible um, studies that he's done. But he's using it to call out mostly white ministers who are telling him, you know, we support you. We support civil rights. We support the fight for justice, but we, we want you to take your time. You know, don't ask for too much too soon. We're, we're trying here. And King is furious by this all his life. You know, one of his biggest complaints is with the church, his own church even, you know, saying even black ministers in Birmingham are slow to get behind him, saying that they don't want to upset the apple cart. And and this infuriates King perhaps more than anything Bull Connor can say or do, because mm. these are people who believe in the Bible, the same Bible he believes in, and he can't understand why they're sitting on the fence, why they're saying, you know, counseling patients. You know, the time for, for justice is now. The time for justice is always now. And, and that's what inspires the letter from Birmingham Jail. It's that people who should have his back are are undercutting his work and telling him to to wait, and um, how long? Not long, right? We're not going to keep waiting, and and that's right. um, that's the beauty of it. Yeah, yeah. I also wondered how much infighting there is in in that particular social group. All social groups seem to have infighting. They break up, and you're not a true Marxist or a true feminist or a true libertarian or whatever, and they splinter off. And there's egos, and there's only so much money to support these groups, and they're fighting for that and so on. How much of it is intellectual? and ideological versus just practical or ego. Oh man, it's all of those things. You know, King is <laughs> um is trying to balance all of these different groups. You know, he's got these younger protesters, black protesters who are pushing him to be more aggressive, and he's got white northern supporters who are sending money but just don't talk about white flight in Boston or Chicago, you know, don't don't draw us into this. And and King, you know, by nature is a pleaser. Which is funny to think about because he's a, he's you know one of our greatest protest leaders, but he doesn't really like conflict. He's he, he's he, he dreads getting into an argument with other black leaders, and 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 this is a, an interesting part of 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 what makes him so effective. Uh, but it also frustrates the hell out of out of his uh, some of his supporters. Even you know within his own you know core inner group, there's disagreement about whether he's being too conservative or whether he's being too aggressive. They don't they want him to to stay quiet on Vietnam because mm. that's only going to make their work in the South more difficult. It's only, only going to cost them political support. It's only going to cost them f funding from white uh, backers because the war is still pretty popular at that point. So King is, is constantly being pushed and pulled, you know, from within and from without. It's, and, and then of course we should point out that um, by the last years of his life, you know, he's really not popular at all. He's, he's um, at least among white Americans uh, he's he's fallen off all of the charts for you know most admired uh, public figures. Uh, Seventy percent of white Americans oppose the march on Washington. Um, you know he's he's a divisive figure. That yeah I know it is amazing. You had another line in your book about he gave his first official sermon preacher sermon at age twenty six and he's murdered at age thirty nine. Thirteen years. Yeah. I mean you think you think he did this for fifty years because there's so much to talk about. No, that's right. Um, his he's he's called to, to duty as a, as a leader of the Montgomery bus boycott at twenty six. He's a very young man, and you know he's won. He's the youngest to ever win the Nobel Prize, and he's and he's his work is done by thirty nine. Of course, he always looks older because he's so somber because he's dressed so conservatively. So we think of him as being an older man, but you know, he died young, really young. And he's twelve years younger than JFK. You know, you think about the youngest president in the White House. Here he is negotiating with JFK. Um, you know, he's. King is a kid compared to, even compared to JFK. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's a sad. Uh, just 
was just watching the um, Ali movie the other night. That's such a great mm-hmm. film. Will Smith is, is Ali. And uh, and then I went back just uh, for fun to watch the original Foreman fight. And the commentators in that fight are going on, oh, George is so young and strong, and Ali is he's just he's so old now. And it's like I looked it up. He was 32. <laughs> it's like <laughs> old. Yeah, although it's like dog years when you're a boxer. You know, <laughs> 32 so is the 32 is 64 in do, in boxing years. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I don't know. Now you think about Tom Brady or uh, uh, Novak Djokovic. It's like these guys just go right into their 40s. Oh, yeah, well, that's true. They, yeah, maybe boxing is different. I suppose. And they didn't have the kind of conditioning and the the medical support yeah. they had back then. And just boxing, you're just taking too many punches. To yeah, head. yeah, yeah. Well, Ali certainly did. Uh, but there's that scene where Howard Cosell takes him aside and says, you know, champ, I'd do anything for you, but you know, I have bosses and they're worried about Malcolm X and Stokely Carmichael and that you're associated with them. And you know, there's only so much I could do. This was during the Supreme court that case over the draft and all that stuff. Yeah. You know, um, Ali, like, like King, um, sainted now he's seen as this, you know, yeah. great American, but he was hated, um, at the most during the most important years of his life, the years that he was of the most influence, he was you know, the least popular. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's always a tough call to to look back with hindsight and go, oh well, you know, they should have done this or that. You know, it's it's always hard to know what to do. You know, I mean, I was watching that Netflix series on um, Michael Jordan's, you know, The Last Dance, about the Chicago mm-hmm. Bulls, and there was some is- incident. I forget what it was, and everybody wanted him to speak out about it. It was a civil rights issue. He basically said, I, I don't do politics. I just want to play basketball. And it's like, how could you not speak out? You're the most famous black guy in, in the world. And, right. you know, you should speak out about this. And he's like, I just don't want to do it. Like, well, I don't know. You know, in hindsight, yeah, yeah, you should have said something back then. Well, I don't know. Yeah, and I've seen other people, you know, sort of revisionist take on it. Because I think his famous quote was, um, you know, Republicans buy by sneakers, <laughs> Nike too. shoes, yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> right. But I've, I've seen other that people say, bad. well, maybe in the long run he did the right thing because look at how great, how much black athletes have benefited from the business side. And yeah. and Michael kind of paved the way for that. So I don't know. I still think he should have spoken out. But um, yeah. it, it's, you know, history judges, the, as you said, the long arc, uh, the, the arc of history is, is long and uh, we don't really, you can't always see it up close. So we don't know, you know, how history will judge Michael Jordan for that yet. Yes, right. I mean, change uh, uh, on, in this subject is really decadal, not year by year. You can't see it. But decade by decade, you can kind of see the shifts, like shifts in polls, you know, to what extent, you know, the Gallup poll used to ask, would you move out of a neighborhood if a black family moved in? Or how would you feel if a member of your family married somebody of the opposite race, the other race? And, you know, the, it used to be way over 50%, like 90%, you know. 50s and 60s and now i don't think they even asked the question anymore. Mm-hmm. so you can kind of see that shift or uh or same-sex marriage now has gone through that so you know we've come a long ways but it's hard to see it uh on a year-to-year scale yeah no question and, and it does seem like uh, and, and that's certainly the the principle of your book uh the, the thesis is that uh it is changing and, and we are making progress even though we sometimes have a hard time feeling that way we lose we lose uh, a sense of hope but it but if you look at the at the big at the big arc, we are making progress, no question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, and I've also noticed uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar doing a little bit of this hindsight bias. I think you know Thomas Jefferson should have not owned slaves, should have given them up, and this person should have done that. They knew slavery was wrong, and so on. Yeah, I suppose it seems like they should have known because if you have to put somebody in chains because they don't want to do this, it's a pretty good sign that they don't they don't think slavery is such a good idea. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, if I lived then, I can't say for sure I'd be an abolitionist and out there, uh, you know, protesting against slavery. I don't, I don't know what I would have done. Yeah, it's we're all product hard. of our time. Exactly. I should have probably given up meat and gas-powered cars <laughs> right. a long time ago, too. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, I, I give up meat every time I see one of those documentary, vegan documentaries or, or the, the, the factory farms. It's like, that's it. And that lasts a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> So that's crazy. All right, let's talk about uh, Vietnam and his position, King's position on Vietnam and how to navigate that controversial issue. You know, after he wins the Nobel Prize, um, Coretta actually says, you know, we have a greater responsibility now to speak out on other issues. And, and, and that's we, she says, you know, because she sees herself as very much a part of this equation. And, and King um, agrees and, and begins, even on that trip to, to Norway, you know, begins speaking out about things like apartheid. And, and he's clearly, you know, recognizing that this is a, 
this is a greater platform for him, and that you know it speaks to his belief in the Bible that the Bible you know talks about universal brotherhood. It's not you know there's, there's no room for nationalism in there or you know racism. So it, it it appeals to him, and and he becomes more aggressive, and he begins talking about um, the, the war much more. Coretta too, Coretta's out there um, on this issue a little bit in front of him at times, um, and it's um, as he's especially after the riots in Los Angeles and and um, Detroit and other places, he says, I can't really call out, I can't I can't criticize the violence in in Los Angeles if I'm not going to also criticize the greatest purveyor of violence on Earth right now, which is the United States government, and that. Uh, we're killing our brothers in Vietnam. We are all b- children of God, and and again, it's a it's it's not just the question of the morality and, and whether his whether this is true to his beliefs. It's a question of the practicality whether it's going to hurt his other work. And he's got his own advisors saying to him, you know, don't do it. You know, you're going to you're going to cost us a lot of support, a lot of funding, um, and you're going to destroy your relationship with LBJ. And and King once again says. I, I've got to do what I believe is right. You know, he's following a higher authority here. And and he says this is one really painful conversation. Then we have the transcript of it because the wire taps, you know, the FBI is listening in. And he's talking to Stan Levison, who's one of his closest advisors. And Levison says that speech that you gave at Riverside Church was a disaster. You know, um, it didn't sound like you. It was too aggressive. It, it, it It's just going to really hurt us. And King says, you know, it may have been politically wrong, but it was not morally wrong, and and I would do it again tomorrow. And it's and and, to, and he and he also says, you know, it's almost you can almost hear him saying, "Don't you understand me? You know, haven't you been paying attention? I've I'm a, I, I've been saying this all along. I, you know, I'm I'm trying to live to a higher moral code here, and I'm not just pick. I can't just pick my battles." Wow, I mean that's pretty admirable. A deeper principle that stands despite what the strategy might look like. Because the Vietnam War was pretty popular for a while. Yeah, it was. Now we look back as like, well, that was a crazy idea. Who thought that was a good idea? Well, everybody. <laughs> right, exactly. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and it's so rare to find, and he had a lot to lose. You know, the, 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 the media started turning on him. Uh, the New York Times, Washington Post, all of these, you know, liberal papers that had supported him came down hard on him after that speech at Riverside Church and, and basically said, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's not qualified to discuss this. And he should stick to his, you know, his area of expertise, never mind that he had a Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, but it, it's just, you know, it's blatant, you know, racism. But it's also informed, we should point out, by the fact that for years now, the FBI has been undercutting his reputation. And all, a lot of these newspaper reporters and editors have seen the transcripts of his tapes with women in these hotel rooms. So his moral authority has been damaged. And that has to contribute when the newspapers start attacking him and saying, you know, shut up, you don't know anything about Vietnam. King has no idea just how deeply the, the, that, that water has been, has been mm. um, poisoned. Mm. Do we know what the thinking was of the Nobel Committee to award him the Peace Prize? Yeah, it was right after Birmingham, and it was, um, you know, the, he had really done more than anybody to call attention to the injustices of, this, of the American South, and, and he was a hero for that. And and I think the Nobel Prize recognized that and wanted to encourage uh, the fight for for racial equality in America. Yeah, interesting. Well, it does give you a lot of extra credibility. Barack, Barack Obama was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his work that he hadn't actually done yet on uh, de-escalating nuclear weapons and all that stuff. And there's only so much you can do, apparently, because he was going to abolish no, uh, what was it, uh, no first use, and then the NATO ally said, "You can't do that. We need the sort of Damocles hanging over Putin or else. Right. And so maybe that was right anyway. <laughs> okay, let's talk about Native Americans. I mean, it, it, it might, when people ask me about reparations for African Americans, well, yeah, but if you go down that road, what about Native Americans? I mean, they've had it just as bad. Not quite slavery, but, you know, extermination and all that land. I always make the point, you know, when Thomas Jefferson bought the Louisiana Purchase from Napoleon, it wasn't Napoleon's to sell and it wasn't That's Jefferson's right. to buy. I mean, yep. come on. <laughs> we right. just took we can, it. Yeah, conveniently ignoring the history of people who are deemed not fully human, uh, which yeah. is the exact same principle that we use to uh, to justify slavery, um, that that certain people are more entitled than others to to freedom, to property, to, uh, you know, in, independence. 
and and that you know haunts us to this day. Obviously, it's still a you know the lingering effects are there. And King argued that you know reparations were necessary to atone for that sin. That you didn't get over that sin just by saying okay we've moved on. That at least psychologically, um, someone had to be paid for their for their injustice, and that applied to the Native Americans too. And you know one of the last things King worked on right before his assassination was this poor people's campaign in which he was attempting to bring together um, Native Americans, black people, um, Mexican Americans uh, to Washington, D.C. for was basically amounted to occupy Washington. And he was going to stay there until the government agreed to meet its demands. And that included guaranteed jobs, guaranteed income, um, just a restructuring of American, the American economy. Yeah. All right, gay rights. I have two quotes that, Epigrams from my chapter on gay rights. This is from Coretta Scott King. I still hear people say that I should not be talking about the rights of lesbian and gay people, and I should stick to the issue of racial justice. But I hasten to remind them that Martin Luther King Jr. said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I appeal to everyone who believes in Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream to make room at the table of brother and sisterhood for lesbian and gay people. Then I have another quote from Bernice King. Baptist minister, daughter of Martin Dr. Jr. My father did not take a bullet for same-sex marriage. <laughs> so a little bit of a contrast there. But again, you know, you don't see that, and it's hard to remember now after the 2015 Supreme Court justice uh, decision. You know, it's the law of the land. But, you know, as late as 2011, both Obama and Hillary said they are against same-sex marriage. It's like, whoa, yeah. So when these quotes were made back in the 90s, or 80s, whatever that was, you know, that, that was not a popular cause. No, and King himself was not strong on the issue of gay rights, and he was not strong on women's rights. Um, he had a blind spot there, and I, you know, somewhat more understandable perhaps on the gay rights issue because it was not as much a part of the conversation yet. Uh, but you know, he had an advice column for Ebony Magazine for a while, and somebody wrote in and said that he thought he might be gay, and he didn't know what to do. And King said, "Yeah, knock that off. Basically, don't don't do that. Whoa, <laughs> right. get, get 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 help." <laughs> That was King's advice. Get, get, get some psych, get some psychiatric help because that's not good. And um, so, you know, he again coming from the time he came from, uh, coming from the South, uh, his religious background, he was not strong on on gay rights, and he was not strong on women's rights. He he really, especially when his own wife was saying she wanted to be more active and that she didn't want to be confined to housework. King basically said, "Tough luck," you know. He and he failed to recognize the the abilities that that women in the movement brought and could have uh, brought in positions of leadership. Um, he was widely criticized for that in his own time by women in the movement, and he never really made much progress in that department. Yeah. All right, another anecdote I want to ask you about this uh, Star Trek television. You know, Nichelle Nichols tells this story, but I don't know if it's ever confirmed, you know, that she was going to quit and do something else. Uh, and Dr. she met Dr. King, and he said, oh, no, you have to stay on this job because it shows what we should look like equal standing, not just here's the black communications director. It's just the communications director who happens to be black. And that's a good thing. Is that story true? Do we know? Yeah, I, I think it's true, but I'm only taking uh, Michelle's word on that. I don't know yeah. if there's any way to document it. There's any, I don't know if there's any way to confirm it. It was a conversation. It wasn't a letter, uh, but King did like pop culture. He didn't have time for movies. I, I, I can never remember hearing that he read a novel um, mm. he, he, or a, uh, he talked about baseball. He liked baseball, but uh, you know, I've never seen a picture of him at a ball game. He he, he was really uh, enormously overworked and exhausted most of the time. And when he when he did get a break, he would try to escape to a, you know a, an island or a beach somewhere for a week to unwind. Um, sometimes he would just um, you know check himself into a hospital for uh, just to, just to overcome the exhaustion. Uh, so I, I don't know that how much how much Star Trek he actually watched, but I like to I like <laughs> right. to think that he uh, that he did have that conversation and, and did recognize the importance of seeing black faces on TV. Well, Roddenberry was definitely a humanist and saw the you know the vision of uh, an interracial crew as no big deal, and right. he did that, and uh, and now it's just common. common. Uh, that also reminded me of the uh, another one of these myth making stories of you know Pee Wee Reese putting his arm around Jackie Robinson when the racist crowd was yelling at him. <laughs> was that ever verified? There's even no, a statue of the two of them. <laughs> that's one of my big pet peeves. You know, I wrote the book about Jackie's first season, and yeah. I proved almost beyond a shadow of a doubt that it did not happen. <laughs> um, what happened was in 48 or 49 in Boston, um, Pee Wee Reese and Jackie Robinson were both middle infielders, and during a pitching change, 
you know, they'd be seen together, arms around each mm-hmm. other, chatting, and and um, and and that sent a powerful message. And some writer at some point decided that it would make a great story if you moved it to 1947, his rookie year, and you had Pee Wee Reese go over and put an arm around him um, to sh- to, sh- to hush the the racist crowd, the hecklers who were using the N word. And that story just took on a life of its own, and and it definitely did not happen in 1947. Um, but it it just made for a better anecdote, so somebody decided to to spin it that way. And I've been fighting against that for for yeah. years now, it's and e- not making any it's, progress. It seems it's in the movie, right? It's in the movie, yeah. And yeah. Uh, of course, once it's in the movie, then people really think it's true. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I saw it with my own eyes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. A little bit like the Babe Ruth call, you know, calling the home run shot, uh, whether that ever happened or not. Yeah. Al Capone, right. Valentine's Day Massacre. Uh, right. No, it <laughs> didn't happen. But, you know, <laughs> don't try shaking the American public out of its favorite stories. Right. All right. Let's talk about uh, attempts to assassinate King. He must have, since this happened, you mentioned the one that the guy stabbed him. What other threats did he get? He must have had death threats a lot. And, and we dealt with that. Yeah, the death threats were almost routine. Um, And, you know, early on when he's just leading the Montgomery bus boycott, uh, dynamite explodes on the front porch of his house. Uh, Soon after that, shotguns fired through the windows. Uh, Then he stabbed at this uh, department store in Harlem. And um, he slugged in the face a couple of times by, by, by white people who just sneak up on him and sucker punch him. And he's getting death threats, you know, by mail and by phone all the time. Phone is ringing at his house all the time to the point where, you know, Coretta dreads every time the phone rings, especially in the middle of the night, because it's going to be somebody saying, you know, we're going to kill you. And and he's got to get up every day and, and live with that. And knowing that the FBI is not protecting him, if anything, the FBI is fomenting this kind of anger. The FBI is mm. creating the environment in which somebody might be inclined to take a shot at him. And in fact, I think, you know, that very likely you could make the case that the assassin's bullet... Um, Definitely is 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 helped along by the messaging that there, that that he's getting from the FBI that this is a man who can't be trusted, a man who's dangerous, and and, and I think King has to get up every day knowing that that's the world he lives in. Did he have personal security? No, he 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 specifically told interviewers he doesn't believe in it. That um, he doesn't think there's anything he can do. Um, if his time comes, his time comes, and. You know, uh, there was an interview just in the last year of his life where someone visited him at his home and was shocked to see that there were no bars on the windows. There was no security guard out front and said, what about your wife and children? And King was kind of cavalier about it. You know, God has in my, has plans for us, and uh, I just don't feel like I can live that kind of life where I'm constantly worried about it. You know, Harry Belafonte told me that King developed a tick, like a little hiccup in the back of his throat, and um, one day it went away, and Belafonte said, what happened to your tick? How did you, how did you cure it? And King said, Oh, I made peace with death. Whoa. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. I don't know what it's like to be that famous and have threats like that, but I, how could it not eat away at you? I mean, just got to kind of be the back of your head when you walk out the door, you know, I get this, you know, the personal security thing. Yeah. I mean, there's only so much they could do. If somebody really wants to kill you, it, it would be really, you'd need something like the secret service. Yeah, although you could argue that LBJ should have recognized that that he needed King, that the nation needed King, and he should have, and he could have said to the FBI, "Let's make sure nothing happens to him," and yeah. and he didn't. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty right. Yeah, even that speech the night before he was killed in Memphis, you know, he had, it sounds almost prophetic, like he he sensed something bad was going to happen. He's not going to get there. I won't get there with you. But how how could you, 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 you must be thinking, you know, somebody wants to kill me. It's not a, a crazy dream to have a nightmare of somebody might take me out because that could happen. Yeah, and he was involved in these protests that often ended in violence. You know, in Chicago, he was hit in the back of a head with a rock. Um, there were, you know, snipers in the trees. And, um, and he'd heard people standing behind him while he's giving speeches in Mississippi saying, you know, you're next. Um, so it was not paranoia at all you know um, yeah. and when he gives this speech and he often talked about his own morbidity but when he gives that speech and says you know i may not get there with you um it's not you know it's not unrealistic unfortunately yeah 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 you kind of avoided the whole uh, assassination conspiracy theories which is good because <laughs> uh, that could take you down a completely different rabbit hole as yeah as i did I not want to go too down well. that. <laughs> 
but I, I'm, I'm pretty convinced uh, from Gerald Posner's book, uh, uh, Killing the, Killing, Killing the, Dream, Killing the Dream, I Killing think. Killing the Dream. Killing yeah. the Dream, yeah. He really looked into every conspiracy theory, and it really looks like uh, James Earl Ray acted alone, as did Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, and there's no evidence of anybody else that could have done it. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I even had Oliver Stone on the podcast. It's like, who? You know, the CIA did it. Who? Alan Dulles? You know, I mean, he... He was there in Dallas. What do you mean? He 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 ordered the assassinate. Where's the paperwork? Is there anything? No, there's no evidence at all. You know, it's just anomaly. So when something big happens, it's called anomaly hunting. When something big happens, you dig through the archives as closely as you can and find it. Hey, well, there's this one little weird thing that happened right there that must mean something. And usually it doesn't mean anything, right? Yeah. Right. And, you know, never attribute to conspiracy what could be explained by randomness or stupidity or just a lone nut. Because there yeah. are lone nuts. There's a lot of them. <laughs> there are. And and James Earl seems to fit that uh, description pretty well. But, you know, his family, King's family, um, still believe in the conspiracy I theories. Know. And King's wife uh, always believed in the conspiracy. And they, they didn't think, you know, they, they basically forgave James Earl Ray. Which I know. I remember shocking. seeing that. There, yeah. Somebody had a film crew in there in prison. Yeah. Yeah, shocking. Because he did it. He killed him. He's a racist. And, you know, there's a lot of them out there, especially yeah. then. And um, same thing with Oswald just a nut. And there's a lot of them. And, you know, so, but I, I get it. I think families want a, you know, people look for a deeper cause, you know, what's the deep root cause, you know, cause you'll hear phrases like, you know, they killed Kennedy, they killed King. Who they, it's just, that guy did it. Not they, but, but the implication is they, you know, the government there, I think a case could be made like you just did, you know, the FBI shouldn't have done this. Johnson should have done more. Yeah. That, okay. That is a reason. Yeah, and you can certainly make the bigger argument that racism killed him, and, and yes. that's that's bad enough. Yes, right. That's enough. That that is the problem. <laughs> okay, let's uh, talk about the legacy of King now, particularly in, in in current events. You you see a lot of this, and I'm one of them who posts things like, "What would Dr. King think about the anti-racism movement and Ibram X. Kendi's message and Black Lives Matter, or whatever? You know, what what would he think today?" And people post about this content of our character not the color of our skin and so on um i don't know what are your thoughts on on the legacy and current events well king is being you know used and abused by everybody <laughs> you know, the nra will find a quote to support uh their cause <laughs> and right. certainly republicans you know ted cruz just used used a king quote for something ludicrous can't even remember what it was it was so so uh, obscure uh, but uh, you know and content of our character is often used to attack affirmative action i think the only thing we can say is that King would still be a radical, I believe. He would still be sticking to the views that that shaped his his life. You know, I look at the life of Harry Belafonte, who never stopped speaking out, uh, who never, you know, he may not have been as as, um, as centrally involved, but but never shed his principles. And I like to think that King would 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 have um, still been in the fight. Who knows what he would have done? But you know, the the fact is that we're 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 not getting the benefit of his wisdom as much as we should be because we have watered down his message. And one of the uh, unfortunate side effects of this national holiday for King is that it 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 reduces our our study of him, and we end up just sort of sticking to the easy quotes. We end up sticking to "I have a dream," and we teach kids that starting in kindergarten, and we we never progress much from there. So I think you know um, King would certainly still be useful to us, and it would certainly be useful to the cause of you know Black Lives Matters and all the others if we actually read his words because they are ma- marvelously prophetic. And, and seem ra- remarkably modern, uh, but only if we read them, you know? And that's the other uh, tragedy about losing him so young. He could have written so much more that we would have spoken so much. I mean, I think, you know, I didn't write, I have 15 books. I didn't write my first book until I was in my 40s. Right. <laughs> you know, and he was dead. Yeah. Ima- imagine if he had another 30 years of, of writing. That's right. And he was becoming more, um, more, Radical in a way, um, certainly more outspoken. He, his vision was expanding. He was thinking about the lessons that we could learn from, you know, European democracies and how those might be applied to our economic system. You know, he was he was still learning, and um, there's no telling where he would have taken us. In terms of his civil rights, uh, what percentage of it is um, taking the foot off the brake, holding back Black Americans versus using the gas pedal? The government needs to do more actively, you know, help lift them up? Well, he was a big believer in government. No question that he thought, 
the American government needed to be much more active and that government could solve certain problems that um, people couldn't solve on their own. That government had a power to you know, declare the values, declare the priorities, and to enforce them, to, to make real you know, issues like you know, guaranteed income and guaranteed jobs and reparations, that these were meaningful steps that really only the government could accomplish. And relying on charity, relying on activists was never going to be enough. So I think um, you know, that's also something we've seen, we've lost in the time since King's life. We've seen this mm-hmm. sense that government should be small and should be you know, doing the least possible. And um, you know, I think most um, history suggests that that's, that's, that's not the case, that you well, want to make the grand social changes. Right, that's, that's the, the conservative view. The Christian conservatives, you know, that, that these problems can be solved by private charity, religion. That's what religion's job, not the government's. That's, that's what they're doing. Right. Yeah, and I, I don't think um, King was going in that direction at all. And also, you know, another one is like Shelby Steele, uh, Thomas Sowell, you know, and others, black uh, conservatives, talk about um, the power of religion and private markets to do this. And that's and they often quote King like that. Um, and so I guess the question is, to what extent, I guess, I don't know what the answer is, you know, can the government actually do that? So they'll cite someone like Shelby Steele will cite the 1965 uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan report on the Negro family, as it was titled. Uh, 25% um, of children raised were by single moms. Now it's like 75%, according to Shelby Steele, something pretty high. So it's even worse. The government can't make people get married. So isn't this a break? This is the conservative argument. Isn't this a breakdown in the social fabric, family? values, morals, and shouldn't Christians care about that? Something like that. Yeah, and, um, you know, I was just reminded of the moment where, right after the March on Washington, when um, all of these black leaders from the march went over to the White House and had lunch with JFK, and Kennedy said to them, um, why don't you do what the Jewish people are doing and these other ethnic immigrants and, you know, really focus on education and, and really get your kids to stay in school and, and, and keep your families intact? And Roy Wilkins turned to the president and basically like cut him off and said, Mr. President, you do your job, we'll do ours. Mm. And uh, I think the president, you know, the, the point there is that the, the government needs to do its part too. Mm. And, not, and not abdicate that by saying that it's an individual problem because there's right. a lot the government can do. Yeah. Well, certainly stopping uh, discrimination, that, that's you know, step one. <laughs> Take yep. the break off. Right. right. Okay. I closed my moral arc book with a quote from Dr. King. Each of us is two selves. The great burden of life is to always try to keep that higher self in command. And every time that old lower self acts up and tells us to do wrong, let us allow the higher self to tell us that we were made for the stars, created for the everlasting, born for eternity. Just a great line. Yeah, that's great. Just what kind of, just, just speak for a minute, what kind of person was he? Just by temperament, Seemed like a nice guy, whatever. I don't know. Open to experience, conscientious, very conscientious. Yeah, everybody I talked to who knew him really loved being in his company. That he listened. You know, you expect this famous, powerful man to, you know, dominate the conversation or to expect everybody to 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 move aside in his wake. But you know, they were driving late through the night, and they had a young aide driving the car for him so he could, you know, get some sleep. He would stay up just to keep the young aide company and, and, and tell jokes, make sure he didn't fall asleep at the wheel. He was just a loving guy. Um, you know, he would come home off the road um, and, and call Juanita Abernathy, Ralph's wife, and say, you know, if I bring over some fish, will you cook it for me? You know, <laughs> he, he, he loved people. And, he, and I think that what that quote tells us is that he, he knew he wasn't perfect, but he really truly believed that, that he had a place and that his, you know, he had a role in the world. And it wasn't just to know, be a celebrity or to be this, this, um, this, this civil rights leader, but to make everybody around him better and, and, and to try to, you know, love everybody. I mean, love is that, is the principle that I think was at the, the heart of everything he did. Mm-hmm. Really genuine. I wonder how early it was in his life when he knew I, I have a different calling than this. Mm. maybe late teens, early twenties. Yeah. I think he, he felt this great sense of ambition, not just for himself, but for, for doing something with his life uh, that many of us feel, but he then suddenly finds himself thrust in a position where 
he could actually live up to that. And that's where it gets interesting because so many of us talk about wanting to change the world. And when you find yourself with an opportunity to really do it, what happens? You know, do you screw it up? Do you step back? Do you, you know, do you um, maybe try it? And then when it gets hard, you know, abandon it. Uh, but he went all in. And then again, that goes back to his faith. I think that he really, um, he felt like he was called to do this. Yeah. A higher call. Certainly that's motivating. All right, Jonathan, final thoughts. 2027, the last final trove of documents is supposed to come out. Is anything big going to change in the story or you think it'll just be fine tuning what we know? My hunch is that we've already heard the worst and uh, we've seen the transcripts of his conversations and we're told that those transcripts are accurate by people who are on those tapes. So we'll get the actual tapes in 2027. That's the only difference. And there might be some stuff on those tapes that we haven't heard. Um, you know, there are some allegations contained in memos that are highly um, controversial. And maybe the tapes will tell us whether those memos, whether King was, you know, in the room during a, an orgy, supposedly. Uh, mm-hmm. that, so the, the, the tapes might shed light on that. But my hunch is that we've already got, we've already heard the worst of it. Yeah. Well, but in any case, that would just be personal life stuff. So what? Right. <laughs> I mean, exactly. Everybody has flaws. It's not, it's, <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's not, that's not what really matters when it comes to what, what would be interesting to me is if there's uh, other things about what the government was doing. That's even worse than what we know. No, that's this a good point. JFK, JFK circles. There's this, you know, what, 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 what are, what's in the rest of the papers? Why won't the CIA, you know, give us the rest of those documents? And I, I think the, the answer is not because they're covering up that they assassinated JFK. It's that they were probably up to additional shenanigans, spying on foreign leaders, you know, trying to rig elections in foreign countries and who knows, right? Yeah, that's a great point. That's a really <laughs> good point. And that would be embarrassing to them. You know, it's like we were doing what? <laughs> yeah, well, we know that most of what is still redacted in the FBI files are the names of the informants. Um, right. And that's because they don't want us to know who was on, who was working with them. And, um, that's, you know, we're still getting some of those names uh, released as, the, as those informants pass away. Uh, some of those names are released. But I think you're right. I think that most likely what's covered up, uh, what's being withheld, is the stuff that makes the FBI look the worst. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jonathan, thank you for your work. What are you working on next? What's your next big uh I haven't decided on the next one yet, uh, but um, I'm, I've got some ideas I'm kicking around, so... You have any you picked some great subjects. Yeah. I Thanks. mean, Jackie Robinson and Muhammad Ali. Oh my God, those are huge. Yeah, it's fun to you know you take the biggest and most important stories. He's intimidating and... characters like that. Uh, Lou Gehrig, that must have been interesting. Again, he died young. He was what thirty one or something. Or... Uh, thirty eight. Yeah, thirty eight. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another just great character. Seems like bigger than life. Yeah, like I'm very. Uh, I'm 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 very lucky to be connected to these guys and telling those great stories. Yeah. All right, Jonathan, thank you so much for your work. Thanks for talking to me. I appreciate that. I enjoyed it.